All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Oh, uh, pray for us. Father, thank you for letting us study the book of Romans uh, together. Um, I pray today that you help us feel the power, the argument of the book of Romans. I pray that you give us a glimpse of the difference the book of Romans has made in the history of Christianity and the history of the world. I pray that you give us a love for this book. I pray that you open our minds to the scriptures. I pray that we would see the glories of Christ as we dive into these pages today. And I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, please take attendance quiz uh, 25 in bright space. And I want to say uh, to all of you, thank you for being here today. We're minutes away from uh, fall break. Uh, so I appreciate uh, you being here. And uh, we're going to have a great uh, time together. We're going to look at the book of Romans. And I just want to start off... Uh, uh, I think we have 18 um, uh, class periods left in this class before the end of the semester, and the majority of those will be spent in the Book of Romans. Uh, so we'll just go through a little uh, at the time. But I wanted to start off with just some favorite verses from Romans. Paul says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's amazing when you think about this verse. Paul, uh, when he wrote this, uh, maybe in uh, 56 uh, AD, um, he, he was a virtual nobody in terms of uh, the world's estimation. Um, he had no wealth. Um, there was no physical monuments that he could point to and say, look at the greatness of uh, Christianity. And yet uh, he's writing to a church uh, in Rome, uh, gilded Rome, some called it, because it was uh, covered with gold. Uh, and he's talking about how he's not ashamed because it's the power of God. It's the power of God to change things. Um, if you go to Rome today, you can uh, pay 10 euro or whatever it is and take a tour. Um, and they'll show you the ruins of imperial Rome. And they're still uh, stunning even today in um, their shape of being ruins. And yet Paul's talking about the power of God and the ability to change and when you look at what happened, um, within 300 years, Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire, and every temple in Rome was converted from being a pagan temple to a, a Christian church. And so it's amazing you have a verse like this. Another amazing verse, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Um, God isn't out uh, to get you. God isn't this judge who's just waiting for you to mess up. Uh, Paul said, no, the truth is that when we're justified by faith, we have peace uh, with God. It says in uh, Romans 8.1, there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Christ Jesus, and if you know the context of this passage, he's just admitted that he has this tremendous struggle with sin, uh, and he can say things, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And yet, in the middle of that, he can say, even right now, right this very moment, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul says in 12.1 that, that the result of all this teaching is 
Uh, he can say, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, uh, not the threats of God, not the law of God, not anything else. I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship um, or your reasonable uh, worship. Uh, another great verse, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if any died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man abounded for many. Uh, just as once we were in Adam and his choice somehow became our choice, so too uh, for those who are in Jesus, Jesus' obedience becomes our obedience. But uh, the book of Romans is not without difficult verses, and maybe um, one of the most difficult ideas in the whole Bible is uh, highlighted in this verse, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And we're going to look at this passage and uh, even the more difficult passage in 9 where it talks about the twins before they were born or had done anything good or bad, uh, that God's purpose in election might stand. It was said the elder will serve the younger. Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. Uh, those are difficult verses and difficult ideas and we want to look at that we want to try to see what exactly is Paul's argument uh, there is he really saying what uh, it appears that he's saying and so when we come to Romans uh, what we're going to do is several things and what we're going to do today is this one see what was it that um sparked Paul to write this book. And my argument, and I think the argument of many others, is that it was racism at the church in Rome. There were Jewish Christians and there were Gentile Christians. And uh, the Jewish Christians um, looked at Gentile Christians as kind of second-class citizens. Uh, okay, you're saved, but you're not saved the same way that we are saved. And Paul knew that that was a racist idea and he wanted to uh, do something about it. And he knew too that the Gentile Christians looked down on Jewish Christians as just plain weird. Um, they dressed funny, they talked funny, they uh, followed peculiar laws. And the idea of the Gentile Christians in Rome um, was, okay, those people are saved too, but they're not really saved the way we are saved. They, they don't really understand what God's grace is about. And so you have these two groups uh, who are divided ethnically because they both have racist ideas that they're trying to square with Christianity. And um, Romans is Paul's attempt to fix that problem at the church in Rome. At least that's my argument. I want you to see if you believe that too after we um, uh, study this book together. Paul wanted there to be one church for God's glory. And even though Paul had never been to this church at Rome, um, he knew that that racist uh, situation there could not stand, and so he wanted to fix it. I want to point out, too, as we dive into chapter 1, I want us to intermingle with our discussion of chapter 1 today the tremendous influence of Romans uh, on all of history. Um, I think you could make the argument that uh, no writing has influenced uh, history the way Romans has influenced history. Um, we're going to see that 
many of the major figures within Christianity, their lives were uh, changed because of understanding the argument in the book of Romans. Um, and we're going to look at the basic outline of Paul's argument. And I suppose that argument is this, that every single person who's saved is saved by God's undeserved favor. And that undeserved favor um, grants salvation and also guarantees the total transformation of the person ultimately. And therefore, if you're a Jewish Christian and you're looking down at Gentile Christians, you're looking at it wrongly because God is saving Gentiles the same exact way he's saving you. And Paul's argument to the Gentile Christians will be, uh, don't think that somehow you're intellectually better because at the end of the day, you're being saved because God's expanding some promises that he made to Israel. Uh, he's expanding those promises to include you. And uh, then his argument would be, this is how you live that out uh, in 12 and following. And then um, we're going to look at uh, Paul's argument in Romans 1, and in particular, um, this statement that he makes about homosexuality. And many who would come to the book of Romans would say, uh, you can't even read through the first half of the first chapter without seeing that this is just a backward book and a judgmental book and um, that we just shouldn't even read it today because uh, Paul has narrow, uh, a very narrow view and a judgmental view. And I think what we're going to see is that Paul's argument, um, while affirming um, uh, God's design for sexuality is in fact uh, all about God's grace to sinners. And I think once we look at Romans 1 in light of uh, what the Bible says everywhere, I think you'll come away with that exact same conclusion. So let's uh, dive in. So this is a picture of some of the ruins in ancient Rome. Um, and you can even tell from the ruins that this was a glorious city at one time. Um, this was the center of the empire. Um, it was a massive city. And in fact, uh, we can't even begin to feel the splendor of the city of Rome. And this is where the Christian church was, and this is where Paul is writing his book. Now, there are some interesting things about the book of Romans. Um, it's only 7,000 words long. And if you want to put that in perspective, a uh, single space is about 10 pages. Um, so to argue that this is like one of the most influential writings in all of history, it's amazingly small uh, compared to the influence that it's had in the argument, influence of its argument. Um, you can read it easily in less than two hours. Um, we call it the Book of Romans. It's, it's really kind of a pamphlet. Um, it, it was originally a letter, um, a, a long letter that Paul uh, wrote to the church at Rome. And he says, he starts off kind of the main statement, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then he tips his hand where he's going with this to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul is admitting, he's saying, look, I know you guys have a problem in Rome. I know that you uh, Jewish Christians look at Gentile Christians, uh, you know, with a jaded eye. Gentile Christians look at Jewish Christians as 
weird. I'm going to try to fix that through an argument. And so, so that's why he starts off with this. Now, if you want to put that in perspective, the reason he's so concerned about this is because this was a stone. I can't, I don't know if this is the actual stone or if this is the reproduction of this stone, but this was the signpost on the wall of the Jerusalem temple. And this is what it says. So imagine that you grew up in a culture where when you walked into the main church of your religion, there was a sign by the door that said this, no stranger is to enter within this balustrade around the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. In other words, Paul grew up in a culture where this sign was posted at the door and it said, if you step through here and you're a non-Jew, you're going to be immediately killed. And so when uh, Christ comes and when Christ uh, reveals, hey, you guys have kind of missed this, it was really important to Paul to point out why this kind of view could not be right. And he writes uh, about Christ. It says, he himself is our peace who made us both to be one. He made us one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. That wall that you used to have to go through the door as a, a Jew, and it said if you step inside here and you're uh, not a Jew or not a circumcised convert, then you will be immediately killed. Paul is saying Jesus fixed that. Jesus has torn that wall down. Jesus has made access for us to God. And so this racist idea that we grew up with that somehow we Jews are somehow inherently better. We Jews are somehow more deserving of God's presence. Paul says that's just not true. What we were taught as children was not true. And this is how Jesus uh, fixed that. Now, in terms of the influence of Rome, uh, Romans, um, if you ask nearly any historian, other than Jesus and the first disciples, who's the most influential thinker in the first thousand years of the Christian era, era most people would say it's Augustine. Uh, in fact, uh, it would be very hard to argue anyone else but Augustine. And uh, Augustine was mightily influenced by the book of Romans. Now, who is Augustine? Well, Augustine was a college professor. He taught rhetoric. He was very good. Um, he was a very handsome man. Uh, he lived with a young lady uh, without being married and fathered a child. Um, he was kind of part of what would be the jet set of his day. His mother... Monica, uh, we, if you've ever heard the term Santa Monica, Saint Monica, that's referencing his mother. Uh, his, Augustine's mother was a Christian. Um, his father was a pagan. His father liked to exasperate his mother by telling Augustine to go live a profligate life. And Augustine did. Um, he was smart, he was handsome, he was wealthy. Uh, his mother, Monica, was crying her eyes out. And she would go with him to wherever his university appointments would be, and she would find the local pastor, and she would go harass uh, the pastor to pray for her son. And finally, uh, Anselm said to Monica one day, Monica, the son of such tears, will never perish. And so she's praying for her son. And uh, and then 
He joins a cult. He becomes part of uh, the cult of the Manichaean. So now he's wealthy and he's living with this girl. He's fathered a child. Um, and instead of just being a pagan, now he's belongs to a cult. And Monica continued to pray and continued to weep. And eventually, when Augustine was 32 years old, uh, for a while, his conscience was bothered, and he began to realize that salvation uh, was not going to be his among the Manichaeans, and he began to look for salvation, and he describes walking in his garden one day, and he said he heard the voice of a child, and he didn't know whether the child was a boy or a girl, but the uh, child was singing a song in Latin. And part of the song was the phrase, uh, tole lege, take it up and read it. Take it up and read it. And so he's plagued with his conscience. He's hearing this child sing this song. And he walks up to his table in his garden, and on the table is a copy of the book of Romans, 10 pages long. And he just randomly flips it open to the page and read the first sentence that he was there, and it said this, Let us walk properly, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And Augustine says when he read that sentence that immediately Christianity made sense to him. He uh, renounced the sexual relationship that he had been in. Uh, he did provide for uh, the woman, uh, provided for her for the rest of his life. He uh, took his son and provided for him for the rest of his life, but he converted uh, to Christianity. And eventually he became um, a minister and he served Christians for the rest of his life in Romans um, was the fundamental thing that influenced his thinking. And uh, most people would say that he um, is the greatest thinker in the first thousand years of the church. It may be, I, I don't know this, but it may be that Augustine realized this put on the Lord Jesus Christ is actually echoing God putting the um, clothes, the, the sacrificial clothes on Adam and Eve. Um, as we're to put on the Lord Jesus, just as God had clothed uh, guilty Adam uh, and Eve. Certainly it's the same words are being used. Augustine began to see that grace the grace of Romans and the implications of that grace. And he went on to have um, great influence on the church and on Western civilization. Another person that the book of Romans influenced greatly was a man named John Chrysostom. And Chrysostom isn't really his name, it's his nickname. And his it comes from two words in the Greek, the word gold and the word mouth. John the golden mouth. Well, who, who is John Chrysostom? Well, he preached um, in a church in Constantinople. This was his church um, about a hundred years later. This was the church they built. It's um, World Historical 
uh, so, uh, society monument now. Um, Chrysostom preached through the entire Bible. He was so good at preaching that people would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go listen to him for an hour explain uh, the text. And they would do that before they went to work every day. Uh, six days a week he would uh, preach in addition to the um, services on Sunday. Well, where did he find strength to do that? Well, this is what he says about himself. He says, as I kept hearing the epistles of the Blessed Paul read, and that twice every week, and often three or four times, whenever we are celebrating the memorials of the holy martyrs, gladly do I enjoy the spiritual trumpet and get roused and warmed with desire at recognizing the voice so dear to me. In other words, um, he said, the way I could have a ministry like that is I would listen to Romans read to me two, three, four times every week. Um, com coming up here in a few uh, days um, is Halloween. Halloween is a little unfortunate that um, our celebration of dressing up like hobgoblins and asking for candy would take over what, in fact, was a wonderful uh, celebration of Reformation Day, the Eve of All Saints Day, Hallows' Eve. And why is that called Reformation Day? It's called Reformation Day because on October 31st, 1517, there was a monk named Martin Luther, who for years had been plagued in his conscience, wanting peace with God, knowing he was a sinner. He tried everything. Uh, he joined an Augustinian monastery, and his uh, instructors told him to do things like beat himself. And so he would beat himself, trying to repent of his sins. He would sleep in on the cold floor in the winter in Germany, trying to earn God's favor. And finally, one of his superiors told him um, to study the book of Romans. And he began to pour himself into the argument of the book of Romans. And in it, he realized that all these things that people were telling him was wrong. And that salvation was by grace through Jesus alone. And so on the eve of All Saints Day, he came to this door in Wittenberg, Germany, and he nailed up 95 debate points that he wanted to debate with uh, the church of his day. And if you go to a church today that's not a Roman Catholic church or an Eastern Orthodox church, then your church's birthday in large measure, goes back to this day in 1517 when the Protestant Reformation started. And it was Martin Luther and his study of Romans, these ten little pages in Romans, that led to his standing up against the false teaching of the church of his day. And even the Roman Catholic Church um, since Vatican II has admitted that Luther was right and that they were wrong. We have the conversion of Augustine. We have the practice of uh, Chrysostom. We have the conversion of Martin Luther. It would be hard to argue that um, anyone was more successful at evangelism than John Wesley. Uh, John Wesley was a powerful uh, preacher. Uh, he wanted to find the most despicable pagans he could find. So where did he ca come? He came to my home state of Georgia. Let's go talk to all those criminals who've been shipped off. And so he came to try to preach conversion and had a miserable ministry. Uh, no one converted. And so 
he went home and as he was going home, a, um, a storm hit and he could see some Christians praying and uh, he saw their confidence and he makes the remark that I went to Georgia to save sinners, but who will save me? And when he got back from that trip, he went to a little um, a meeting house on Aldersgate uh, and he heard a minister just read to him uh, Martin Luther's preface to the book of Galatians. Uh, and he said, my heart was strangely warmed. And he says, I was converted because of that. So uh, Luther studies Romans and then Galatians. And then out of that, John Wesley is converted and preaches very effectively to uh, tens of thousands of people. And it isn't just that there is religious influence. There's actually social influence from a man named William Wilberforce. And if you don't know who Wilberforce is, uh, you sh should know. Um, he was four feet, 11 inches tall. Um, some people say he was the shrimp who became a whale. He's the guy who got slavery abolished in England. Um, people made fun of him. Uh, people said that he was overly religious, but he fought tooth and nail to end slavery in England. And he wrote one book. And his one book... Uh, is about, if you want to end slavery in England, get people to understand the argument of the Book of Romans. If people understand the argument of the Book of Romans, slavery will end tomorrow. That's what Wilberforce um, believed, and he spent his entire life, but he got first the slave trade outlawed, and then six days, I think, before he died, uh, slavery was done away with in all of England. This is what John Piper says about Wilberforce. For Wilberforce, practical deeds were born in, quote, peculiar doctrines. By that term, he simply meant the central distinguishing doctrines of human depravity, divine judgment, the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross, Justification by faith alone, regeneration by the Holy Spirit, and the practical necessity of fruit in a life devoted to good deeds. The Book of Romans has had tremendous influence on history. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, that's why we're going to work carefully over these uh, next uh 18 or so um, sessions together. This is the first sentence that Paul writes. Paul, a slave. And right off the bat, I'm just intrigued by these two words. Uh, Paul, Paul, a slave. Because Paul, uh, you may or may not know this, um, was not given to Paul by God. Um, even the Holy Spirit calls Paul Saul, his original name. And you might know that Saul in the Old Testament was a guy who was head and shoulders above everyone else. What you may not know is that the uh, name Paul is actually a Latin name. And it means the little guy. Something had happened in Saul's life where he changed his own name. Maybe it was as he went into the Roman world and he wanted to present a name that was less uh, problematic to the people. So instead of his good Jewish names, uh, Shaul or Shaul, he uh, changed it to Paul. 
He changed from the big guy to the little guy. And I wonder um, if it sparked many conversations when uh, people would ask him, well, uh, why, why do you call yourself the little guy? And I wonder if Paul would say, well, let me tell you about the big guy. Because that's not me. And then the very first word he uses to describe himself is a doulos of Christ Jesus. And this word doulos for Roman people was a shameful word. No one wanted to be a doulos. You could be an oikonomos, a, a steward. You were technically a slave, but you were respectable. But nobody wanted to be a doulos. And Paul said, if you want to know who I am, know this. I am the doulos of Christ Jesus. I'm called to be his authorized spokesperson. I'm set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. And I'm preaching about his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, but was declared son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Christ Jesus, our Kyrios, through our Lord, uh, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience that comes from faith. For the sake of his name, among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome, who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ten pages, that's how it starts out. Not how you would have expected, but this is a ten-page document that has changed human history. Paul says, for in it uh, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, or I would translate it from one degree of faith into a greater degree of faith, from faith into faith is what it literally says. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This was a sentence that Martin Luther said opened to him the doors of the divides of Christianity. And then Paul takes a strange turn. So he's been very positive, and now he's talking about God's wrath. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. If you break God's law, God has wrath for that. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who, by their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Nobody's going to be able to say when they stand before God, I just didn't have enough evidence. God's going to say, you did have enough evidence. I put the evidence within you. Paul says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they were without excuse. And you can almost hear the Jewish Christians start saying, yeah, you get them, Paul. You get those, you get those evil Gentiles. They're bad people. They're plagued with all kinds of sins, and not only sins, but sexual sins, and, and you get them, Paul. Paul's going to say in Romans 2, we're going to see this next time we're together, he's going to say, who are you to judge uh, another man? Um, uh, you who judge, do you follow the law, or do, do you break the law just like they do? So Paul's kind of baiting his audience here, um, going through what in particular are Gentile vices. And then he says this, For although they knew God, 
they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for idols resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the reason uh, these are kind of Gentile uh, sins is because Paul knew uh, that um, female homosexuality uh, was traced back to um, uh, the Isle of Lesbos, is where the word lesbian. Uh, comes from, and there was a, a woman um, uh, there who wrote erotic poetry, Sappho, and it's all about uh, erotic relationships among uh, women, and so this is a very Gentile uh, sin, and Paul's going through it, and you can hear the Jewish Christians say, yes, look at those disgusting people. And then Paul says this, and men likewise gave up the natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error. And that's what that passage says. If you go read it in the Greek, it's even more graphic uh, in terms of describing uh, that particular sin. And, and I, I remember as a, uh, classics major, uh, one of the first uh, uh, texts we had to read in upper level Greek was a text about uh, homosexual erotic uh, love. And I remember uh, my pagan teacher, how uh, uh, delighted she was when we had to read these, you know, kind of graphic uh, things about uh, homosexuality because it was a, a very Greek thing. It was a normal Greek thing. And so we come to that and we live in the 21st century and people will say, you just should stop reading Romans because that's just uh, backwards, it's homophobic, it's, it's so um, unenlightened um, and Paul is just such a judgmental, uh, terrible person. Nothing can good, good can come from this book. I think that argument misses what Paul's doing. And here's why I think that. Paul is quoting the Sodom and Gomorrah story. And you know the Sodom and Gomorrah story God comes down with two angels. They talk to Abraham. Abraham pleads if, if there are ten righteous people, don't destroy. Uh, God goes back to heaven and two angels go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then in Genesis 19, it starts calling one of those angels Yahweh. And the men of Sodom and Gomorrah um, uh, Sodom are going to, they want to gang rape uh, these two angels uh, and even uses words like, uh, uh, it will be worse for you than it will be for them. So um, God says, I'm going to go down to sea. And so God went down and it was just as bad as had been reported. And so God uh, destroys the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Everyone knows that story. Very few people ever read this story. The story of the Levite's concubine. I, think, I had you read it in the homework uh, uh, 
Uh, and do you realize that the story of the Levites' concubine is almost exactly the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? The people have just changed. Instead of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's God's people. And instead of the angel, it's this Levite. And what kind of person is he? Well, he's a guy who has a concubine. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we're kind of inoculated to what it's telling us. But um, the word concubine um, is uh, a polite way to say it would be mistress. Um, I'm told that there's actually a modern term uh, for concubine, um, a side chick. Is, is that true? Do people use the term side chick? Like... Looks like a wife, acts like a wife, not a wife. I mean, is that true? Do people actually use that term? This Levite has a side chick. Now, let me just translate it into our terms. This mega church pastor has a side chick. What do you think about that? Should pastors have side chicks? No. And not only does he have a side chick, he's a drunk. He gets drunk for a week. And then this Sodom and Gomorrah story happens, and he throws out this woman that he's supposed to be in love with. And we don't know in the story whether they kill the woman or whether he kills her. It seems to me like he kills her uh, when he gets her home and like she's being abused outside and he's asleep and you just look at that and I hope you're infuriated by that and say God you should wipe that person you should wipe all these people off the face of the map and I think that's how we're supposed to feel because this is wicked if you ask the question who is more wicked Sodom and Gomorrah or these people, this is the one who's going to get my vote every time. Now, here's the thing that I want to ask you. What tribe replaces Sodom and Gomorrah? Isn't it Benjamin? Aren't the Benjaminites kind of the Sodomites 2.0? And remind me this, what tribe does Paul come from? Doesn't he come from the tribe of Benjamin? And doesn't Paul write in Romans 9, if God had left us alone, we all would have become like Sodom. We all would have been made like Gomorrah. Paul's argument in Romans isn't, look at those bad people, look at those rejected people. Paul's argument is, Romans is, we're all people and we're all infected with the same polluted nature. And if God had left us alone, there would be no limit to the sin that we do. It isn't that people who fall into that particular sin are somehow hated by God. The truth is we're all tainted with evil. And if God just left us live forever and gave us enough uh, opportunity, there would be no limit to the sin that we would do. Paul's argument is that Jesus Christ is the one who can pay break the power of canceled sin. Paul's argument is that Jesus Christ is the one who can set us free from our sins. And so his argument, far from saying, oh my goodness, look at those awful people, his argument is, if you want to be one church, realize this, there aren't bad people and good people, they're just people. And God saves I see that my time has gone. I hope you have a great uh, 
fall break, and I'll see you on Monday.